All righty. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to our uh, online webinar on marijuana federalism, um, the new book that uh, is out. I'm for those that are, are curious. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, a few quick uh, housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, first, um, this is the first uh, online uh, CLE webinar that we've hosted at the law school, and we are eager to get your feedback on what works and doesn't work about this format. Um, we're, we're glad that we're able to offer CLE uh, credit for people that are participating. We're glad that other folks may be participating just to learn more about this issue. Um, uh, but if you're registering for CLE, certainly uh, be sure to provide us feedback on what you think of the program. Uh, and if you're not uh, taking this for CLE, but would like to give us feedback on this program, uh, we appreciate uh, that as well. Credit. Okay. Uh, a quick uh, a note also for those of you that are uh, unfamiliar with the webinar format uh, that Zoom uses. Uh, this is different from Zoom meetings that you may be familiar with uh, in that uh, you don't have to worry about making noise if you're an attendee. We will not hear you. You will not interrupt. Um, uh, panelists, on the other hand, we have to be careful about uh, muting ourselves uh, if we're going to make background noise. Uh, but this is set up essentially as a presentation. So if you're uh, listening to this, uh, you don't have to worry if, if you make a little noise at your desk or wherever you're watching, uh, you, do, you will not interrupt the program. If you'd like to ask questions, uh, you can either email the questions to me, but even better, uh, there is a Q&A box um, that, that you can open and you can submit your questions uh, to us and uh, we can then answer your questions throughout the program. Uh, so please do that uh, while after our presentations. We will be eager to get your questions. Uh, this really is a, a, a wonderfully broad ranging topic uh, and one that's fascinating and that uh, we will only touch on some of the aspects of it in our initial presentation. Um, uh, with, um, uh, with that introduction uh, out of the way, um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jonathan Adler. I'm a professor here at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Cassandra Robertson, who is also on the faculty here, and, on Ju and with Julie Hill, uh, who is a professor at the University of Alabama Law School. Uh, and we're, uh, both uh, Andra and Julie have uh, authored chapters uh, in the book, Marijuana Federalism, and they will be talking about their chapters. I edited the book, and so I will try and give an overview of why we did this book, why we think this is an important topic, why we think it's important for lawyers uh, and policymakers, uh, and why it's also an interesting topic as well. Um, in terms of um, uh, why this subject, why this book, why are we talking about marijuana federalism, why uh, perhaps is the federalism aspect of marijuana policy perhaps even more important than the simple question of whether or not legalization is a good or a bad idea. Um, it, the real reason is because different parts of the country not only have different preferences about marijuana policy, but they're acting on those preferences. And that's creating some very interesting legal and policy challenges uh, that lawyers have to deal with, that policymakers have to deal with. Um, and just 25 years ago, uh, marijuana was illegal throughout the entire United States. It was illegal under federal law. It was illegal in every state. Um, but beginning in the 1990s, states initially began to start legalizing marijuana for medicinal purposes, California being the, the first notable jurisdiction uh, to do that. Um, and after California, California did it, other states started following suit. In 2012, Colorado and Washington became the first states to legalize marijuana, not merely for medicinal purposes, but also for recreational purposes. In effect, they fully withdrew from uh, the federal uh, war on drugs, at least as applied to marijuana. And at this point, 11 states and the District of Columbia have legalized marijuana for both medicinal and recreational use. Uh, 15 states have de decriminalized low-level possession, uh, so the amount of possession that someone might just have if, if they have marijuana for themselves. 22 states allow medicinal use of marijuana quite broadly, uh, and then additional states allow uh, medicinal use of at least some uh, marijuana-derived products, uh, CBD oils, Charlotte's Web, things like that. 
Um, but despite all of this, and this is something that my students don't, uh, I, I need to remind my students of, um, marijuana remains illegal under federal law. When you possess marijuana, distribute marijuana, you are violating federal law, even though from state law purposes, what you're doing may be perfectly legal. As a practical matter, because most law enforcement is done at the state and local level, you may not have to worry very much about being arrested or prosecuted, but from the standpoint of wh whether you're violating the law, the federal prohibition uh, remains. Although the federal government uh, is one of limited and enumerated powers, the Supreme Court has upheld the federal government's authority to regulate not merely the interstate transportation and commerce of marijuana, but even the local use distribution and possession, uh, and including um, distribution and possession that has no uh, commercial aspect to it. And as, as both Andra and Julie are gonna talk about, the existence of this federal prohibition not only means that when someone uses or distributes marijuana, uh, they are violating federal law in some abstract sense, it actually has practical implications. So Julie's gonna talk about the implications in banking law, uh, where banks and financial institutions that are providing services to marijuana businesses that are legal under state law have issues that arise under banking law when they do that. Uh, Andra's gonna talk about the, the concerns raised for lawyers who, as we all know, are not supposed to assist clients in the prospective violation uh, of the law. Uh, it affects tax law. Uh, marijuana businesses, though legal under state law, cannot take the same deductions for business expenses that other businesses can. Uh, it has implications for uh, gun owners. Uh, having a medical marijuana card is a reason uh, to be disqualified from purchasing a gun under the federal background check system. Uh, marijuana, uh, run, marijuana possession and distribution are RICO predicate offenses. And so we've already seen the filing of civil RICO suits against marijuana facilities uh, on, uh, seeking the, the quite substantial damages that RICO provides because of that remaining federal prohibition. And one thing that's interesting about this area is that this is not a, a problem or a conflict that the executive branch can simply wave away. Uh, the Obama administration issued several memoranda, uh, several from the Justice Department, the 2009 Ogden Memorandum and the 2011 Cole Memorandum, which made explicit what we all knew, which is the typical US Attorney's Office has no interest in running around trying to prosecute low-level possession of marijuana. But the, the prohibition remains. So the Cole Memor Memorandum, for example, instructed US attorneys not to prosecute uh, marijuana offenses where there was not a connection to interstate trafficking or distribution to children or something else that suggested a distinct federal interest. As a matter of policy, that may, might make perfect sense, but as the Cole Memorandum made clear, this was not a legalization of marijuana at the federal level. This was ra rather a form of enforcement prioritization. Uh, and Zach Price of, of uh, the University of California at Hastings has a chapter in the book that talks about the issues of, of enforcement discretion in this context. Uh, these memos, again, indicated DOJ policy, but they didn't change the underlying uh, legal framework. And they were also policy memoranda that could simply be rescinded. Uh, Jeff Sessions uh, rescinded the Cole Memorandum upon becoming Attorney General. Um, Attorney General Barr has said uh, that he has no intention of reissuing something like the Cole Memorandum. He said that uh, uh, at the same time, he doesn't think that U.S. attorneys should prioritize marijuana offenses over other more serious crimes, uh, but that there is still a federal prohibition that the Justice Department can't completely ignore. Uh, and it suggested that there may be uh, some need for legislative change. The last point I'm, uh, I'm, I want to make before turning it over uh, to Julie is that if we can figure out how to deal with this conflict between federal and state law, there actually are some really significant uh, policy benefits from letting different states try different things, particularly if they can do so in a way that doesn't infringe with uh, the preferences of their neighbors. Switching from uh, a, a completely underground illegal industry as marijuana was to something that's legal, that's perhaps regulated, uh, that's used for different purposes, that isn't just like flipping a switch. Uh, there are lots of differences in different jurisdictions about the way the rules are constructed 
And we have a lot to learn about what the effects of decriminalizing or completely legalizing marijuana are. Uh, there is a chapter in the book that talks about the initial research and the initial data that we have, from, particularly from Colorado and Washington, but also from some other states. Uh, but this data is still preliminary. And over the coming years, we will learn a lot more about what happens uh, when marijuana is legalized. It looks like that the effects are less than people thought. Uh, the beneficial effects, including to state treasuries, are less than people hoped. The negative effects appear to be less than people feared. Uh, but that obviously could change. And we can learn a lot about uh, how slight differences in legal regimes actually can change outcomes. Uh, and that's one of the benefits of a federalist system. And that's something we might be able to benefit from if we can deal with this conflict in federal, between federal and state law. So with that introduction uh, to the issue and kind of why we did this book, uh, I want to turn things over uh, to Julie, uh, who is going to uh, talk about uh, the particular issues that arise in the banking and financial services sector. Julie? Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, I started to be interested in uh, this issue about marijuana and banks shortly after Colorado uh, decided that they wanted to legalize recreational use. And I have family in Wyoming, and so we would fly in to Denver and drive from Denver up to Wyoming. And if you've been along the road there, sort of right by the Denver International Airport, you see a number of, of different marijuana shops. And so, you know, normal people would probably be like, oh, what are they selling? And is it any good? But what I saw when I, I saw these marijuana shops is, uh, how, how do people pay for this stuff? Do they have banks? Um, so I did, in fact, persuade my husband that we should visit several of them to ask about um, their uh, businesses. And uh, one of the things that I found out is that a lot of the businesses had a very difficult time getting bank accounts. And so when we visited Choice Organics in Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, we saw a sign on the door that says we only take cash and go to the ATM that's in the front entrance. And so we went out to the front entrance and we saw that the ATM was out of order. And when we chatted with them, they said, yeah, running the ATM found out we were a marijuana business and they shut off not just our banking but also this ATM that was approximately located there. So uh, the question though is why are banks skittish to serve these marijuana businesses? And if you ask a bank, they all give pretty much the same answer. Um, I've chosen to use a Wells Fargo quote here because we all know, you know how much Wells Fargo cares about following the law. And, and as they assure us here, the reason that they don't bank marijuana is because they follow federal law and it's illegal under federal law. And so I thought we might talk for just a minute about what that federal law is that banks are concerned about. Um, because banks, uh, as you might or might not have realized, uh, we have a dual banking system in the United States, and that means that a bank can choose to either be chartered um, by federal authorities and become a national bank. Um, bank of America, NA, stands for National Association, or they can go to a state and get a charter from a state regulator in order to open their bank. And so you might think, well, that's easy. Um, if you're a national bank, you follow federal law and you worry about um, the illegality of marijuana. But if you're chartered in Colorado, you just go for it because Colorado doesn't care and they've given you your bank. But as it turns out, at least in banking, even state chartered banks are uh, really subject to a number of federal controls. And the first of those is the one that Jonathan's already mentioned, federal criminal law. So everybody has to follow federal criminal law. People are supposed to follow it. Corporations are supposed to follow it. State banks are supposed to follow it. And so um, it's illegal to, of course, distribute marijuana and it's illegal to aid and abet the distribution of marijuana. So you can imagine that if a bank made a loan to a marijuana business, uh, regulators could view that as if they are aiding and abetting the sale of, of marijuana. Um, banks also have to worry about anti-money laundering laws. There are lots of different ways to commit the offense of money laundering, but in essence, money laundering is taking money that comes from an illegal source uh, like marijuana and putting it towards banking the marijuana industry absolutely violates anti-money laundering laws. Um, 
beyond just the criminal law, um, there are other controls over state banks. The first uh, is federal deposit or if you're a credit union, share insurance. So in order to be even a state chartered bank, most bank, uh, all states require you to have FDIC insurance so that if you go out of business, your depositors are protected. The federal government provides that insurance. The only way to get that insurance is to do what the FDIC or in the case of a credit union, the National Credit Union Administration tells you you're supposed to do. And so if they say no on marijuana, that means you're no because otherwise they can take away your insurance and you're unable to be a bank or credit union. And then finally, um, the Federal Reserve has lots of oversight over state banks. Um, this happens in several different ways. First of all, you might just be directly regulated by the Federal Reserve because you've chosen to be a member of the Federal Reserve by, by paying a fee. Um, second of all, you might be organized in a holding company structure. If you are, your holding company is overseen by the Federal Reserve. And then finally, banks process payments. And lots of the payment systems that we use in the United States are provided by the Federal Reserve. So the automatic clearinghouse that sends automatic deductions or, or deposits to your account that's operated by the Federal Reserve. If you want cash delivered um, or picked up from your bank, um, likely that's going to or from the Federal Reserve. And so if you want access to be able to handle those sorts of payments, you need the Federal Reserve to tell you that it's okay. And if they decided that you were too big of a risk because you're banking marijuana, they could perhaps be in, in those sorts of, of payment systems which would not be good if you were a bank. Um, so you say, yeah, well, the federal government has all of this control, but at least for regular people, Jonathan's just told us, they don't have resources to enforce it all. So what makes it different for banks? Do bank regulators actually care about this stuff or are they just gonna ignore it? Um, and admittedly, it's hard to know exactly what regulators are gonna do without sort of testing them. And that's kind of a, a dangerous proposition if you're a bank because you don't want your bank taken away as you're making money. Um, so one way we can sort of see what regulators might think about marijuana banking is to look at guidance that they've provided. And the federal banking regulators, the Office of the Controller of the Currency, the FDIC, the NCUA, and the Federal Reserve have all said that they want to follow the lead of the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, a division of the Department of Treasury that's tasked with um, anti-money laundering enforcement. And so they're very romantic folks, apparently, because back on Valentine's Day in 2014, they came out with some guidance about marijuana banking. And they said, well, um, if your customer's business doesn't implicate any federal enforcement priorities, then um, enforcement against you may not be appropriate. And they had a long list of priorities, preventing the distribution of marijuana to minors, preventing the sale from going to other criminal enterprises like drug cartels, preventing the diversion of marijuana from places where it's illegal to places where, places where it's illegal. Um, and preventing the use of, of violence and firearms in the cultivation and distribution of marijuana. Um, so you've got these long list of priorities and, and what is supposed to happen is the bank is supposed to figure out if the customers are coming close to any of these priorities. If they are, then they're not supposed to be banking them, but if they don't, then maybe regulators will leave them alone. So the first problem with this guidance from a bank's perspective is it's not very definite. They don't say, if you comply, we definitely will leave you alone. They say, we might leave you alone if you comply with these priorities. The second problem with the, this guidance from a banker's perspective is that it sets a pretty high bar for compliance. Think about it from a bank's perspective. How are they supposed to know if their regulator, uh, how are they supposed to know if their customer is selling marijuana to a minor or selling marijuana that might be transported by that customer across state lines? It can be hard for banks to sort that out. But assume we've got a bank that gets comfortable with this, this just being may guidance and we get comfortable with a bank that uh, knows its customers and feels confident that they're complying with the enforcement priorities. Then what? Well, you're still not done with that guidance document. The next thing the guidance document says is how um, 
you need to tell us about it. Um, you know you're supposed to file suspicious activity reports with FinCEN uh, for any activity or financial transactions that uh, violate the law. And so if you have a marijuana related uh, transaction or series of transactions, it violates the law. And so you need to fill out a suspicious activity report and tell us, um, you can tell us it's marijuana limited if you don't think it implements any of those enforcement priorities, but if it implicates some of those priorities, then you need to file a marijuana priority suspicious activity report and detail all of the reasons why you think it violates the federal law. Um, you also need to file a suspicious activity report if you close someone's account or decline to process a transaction because you think it involves marijuana. And then it reiterated that um, the currency transaction reports um, that are required for uh, cash transactions involving $10,000 or more, or maybe some smaller amount that is designed to look like $10,000 or evade the $10,000 limit, um, all that needs to be filed. So this is a pretty big paperwork burden just to give you a sense sense of how big of a burden this might be on a bank, um, consider the uh, case of Partner Colorado Credit Union. They're a pretty small credit union in uh, Colorado that does a lot of marijuana banking. Um, for their ordinary, uh, uh, have 33,000 regular customers and they filed um, during a couple month period 226 suspicious activity reports but for their marijuana related businesses all 220 of them they filed more than 7,000 suspicious activity reports so it's really required um, just to comply with the guidance and even if you comply with the guidance you're not guaranteed that you won't be subject to some sort of enforcement action from your federal regulators and so where this leaves most banks is they're just not interested in marijuana banking it's a costly and risky proposition for them so uh, FinCEN releases numbers about how many banks have filed suspicious activity reports or report to bank marijuana banks and only a small fraction of them uh, at least as of the end of the year 2019, we're um, participating in marijuana banking. And this is likely to be the case, I think, for some, some amount of time. But I'll stop there and um, I guess uh, let, let Cassandra talk about something more exciting than banks. Okay, so um, thank you, everybody. Um, let me actually double check and make sure that I'm on. Okay. Um, so talking about lawyers providing legal advice for marijuana business entities um, shares a lot of the same issues that you've heard with the banks with these federalism issues that permeate the books of, of, of this book of what can the state do um, and what can the state not do once it has authorized marijuana. Um, the lawyer's particular problem comes from model rule 1.2, uh, which a version of which exists in every state, which provides that a lawyer shall not assist a client in conduct that the lawyer knows to be criminal. So the question then is, is the client's conduct illegal when state law has authorized marijuana business entities, um, but federal law has not? And attorneys, of course, when they're first licensed, um, they take an oath to uphold the Constitution and the Constitution's Supremacy Clause um, certainly suggests that, that federal law would prevail over contradictory state law. Um, so if, if lawyers then have this ethical oath to follow the Constitution, um, to what extent are they able to, to provide 
assistance or advice to these state marijuana business entities or state licensed entities. Um, initially, when the state started to deal with this question, they tried to draw a line between advising clients and providing them assistance. And so some states in the earliest ethics opinion said lawyers couldn't do anything more than advise clients that marijuana is illegal under federal law. Um, not terribly helpful, right? I mean, every marijuana business entity is probably well aware that it's not authorized under federal law and that they are operating under state law. Um, so later, later ethics opinions tried to draw a kind of more tailored line saying, well, it's okay for attorneys to advise their clients about what the state law means and help them to understand the state law, but they can't give them any assistance in their business. And so they tried to draw the line of, okay, it's all right to maybe tell clients what the state law means, but can't advise them about how to comply with it. Well, that's a very fine line to try to draw. Um, and states said, well, you can't, as an attorney, you can't you know, help the client draft any contracts or help them work out a sales agreement, you can't help them do any tax planning, because that would cross the line into assisting with an illegal activity. Um, states realized, I think, pretty quickly that this was going to be a problem, um, because if you're going to create this new industry, the last thing that you want to do is to not allow those new business entities to get legal advice, right, and to get legal assistance with their businesses. So the states started to move toward a state harbor. Um, many of them, like Ohio, ended up amending the, the state rules of professional conduct to say that a lawyer who provides either advice or assistance um, to help the client comply with state law does not breach the rules of professional conduct. Um, and ethics opinions tended to come to the same place. Um, but even then, it's tricky. So not every state moved towards that state safe harbor, although many of them did. And of the ones who did move to a safe harbor, a number of them specifically referenced the Cole Memorandum. So their rationale was because, the, because of the Cole Memorandum's existence, um, the supremacy clause isn't a problem here because the federal government is at the very least tolerating these kind of state experiments with marijuana legalization. And so at least for those states that adopted ethics opinions that were specifically contingent on the existence of that memo, um, we don't know what happens um, now that the memo has been withdrawn, whether that changes the lawyer's ability to assist these companies. So what happens if lawyers are unable to, to provide assistance? Um, well, one problem is going to be higher costs, right? Fewer attorneys are going to be willing and able to take on this representation. So these new businesses that the states are trying to, you know, give them room to experiment, um, they're, they're they're suddenly facing a higher cost of legal assistance. It's harder to find an attorney, and when they can find an attorney who's willing to provide legal service, um, they are sometimes getting lower quality attorneys who um, maybe don't have other sources of revenue, who don't have other clients, um, who just aren't as experienced. And um, at the worst end of it, they might even be getting the unscrupulous attorneys who just aren't worried about violating the rules of professional conduct. Um, in, in one recent case, one recent ethics case, an unscrupulous attorney overbilled a client, and then when, when the client um, who was in the marijuana business tried to complain about it, um, the attorney actually threatened the client and um, threatened the client with the possibility of jail, um, referred to them disparagingly as a drug dealer, um, basically breached the attorney's fiduciary duty in, um, in, in many different ways. So, um, 
the, the state certainly have a very strong interest in high quality legal representation if they are going to try to develop marijuana business entities. Um, states have a limited ability to encourage legal representation. So the biggest thing they can do, like I talked about, is to amend their rules of professional conduct to make it clear that lawyers are able to undertake this representation. Um, even that, though, is not a panacea. So there are, there are other things that still discourage attorneys from doing so. One of the biggest is actually the difficulty in getting uh, malpractice insurance. Um, right now, basically, every malpractice insurance policy um, specifically excludes cases where the attorney is engaged in illegal conduct. Um, and as a result, um, a number of malpractice insurance companies have actually withdrawn insurance from lawyers who represent marijuana business entities, even when that's only a small part of their business. And even when the lawyer um, hasn't had the policy withdrawn, the lawyers can't count on the policy defending them if they are accused of malpractice. Um, so the states can help the situation, but they can't solve it. I think really the, the only way that attorneys are likely to feel comfortable providing representation in this industry um, would be if the federal government would allow the states to opt out of the Controlled Substances Act's mar marijuana prohibition um, that would eliminate the risks for lawyers of um, discipline in those in the states where that's a possibility and that would solve the malpractice insurance policy which i think would would go a long way into making attorneys feel more comfortable taking on that representation and with that i think i'm happy to move on to questions if there are some all righty, great. Yes, we have lots of questions. Um, I want to start, uh, take the, the moderator's prerogative, I guess, and um, start with a question uh, for Julie. Um, and that is, uh, during the Obama administration, there was an effort to try and give banks some certainty um, in this space that, that, that uh, wasn't, I guess, particularly successful. Um, uh, what, um, uh, what, uh, would what would be necessary to uh, give banks um, the the ability to serve uh, MBEs or, or marijuana business entities? Um, is it something that can only be done statutorily? Uh, are there things that can be done short of legalization at the federal level that would solve the banking problem in this space? So I do think that the fix here has to come at the federal level because of the pervasive federal control over banks. I think that there's just very little that states can do. Um, states have tried um, going down this path. Colorado tried chartering a state um, credit union and it was a, a non-starter to get uh, share insurance and access to Federal Reserve payment systems. California has looked into chartering uh, a or creating a, a state-owned bank to handle banking and, and hasn't gotten very far down the path. So I think that the answer has to come from the federal government. And then the question is, well, well what? what? What does the federal government need to do? And I think that we've seen the problem with guidance and, and that is uh, that even an administration that says, I want this to happen, is only that administration. And so um, if the government now says it's fine, you know, three years, two years, a month, <laughs> six months from now, um, other people might not think that it's, it's great. And so for a bank to um, want to onboard customers and go to the trouble of serving them, I think they need some long-term uh, stability that can only come uh, if that, that doesn't come through regulatory guidance. And so um, then folks say, well, then the answer is just for us to decriminalize marijuana at the federal level. And I think that that is a good first step, but I think that it's only a first step. So um, we recently saw with hemp, uh, the federal government say, well, it's no longer illegal per se to grow hemp in the United States. But now in order to grow hemp, you need a license from a state agency that has a robust 
program for vetting those who get to grow it, making sure that they're actually growing hemp and not marijuana. And so even though hemp is legal at a federal level, um, you didn't see banks just throw open their doors to bank the hemp industry because banks still need to comply with anti-money laundering laws. They still need to make sure that their customers are complying with the law surrounding hemp. It's not that all hemp is legal or that all drugs are going to be legal or that all marijuana would be legal, right? Presumably, even if marijuana is decriminalized federally, it's going to be illegal to sell it to minors and able to sell it with your cocaine, right? Like there are going to be some limitations on it. And so banks are still going to have to do some amount of due diligence. And so um, one of the things I think you have to watch for if you really want marijuana banking is you need to make sure that banks have a, a reliable way to vet the sorts of things that they actually need to vet. So um, we need to be careful about what sort of things we want banks to be the gatekeepers of. Do we really expect banks to make sure that no marijuana is ever sold to a minor? Or is that something that other regulatory officials do and we expect bank some sort of representation from the customer that they're not doing it and then that's good enough, sort of like they would with alcohol. And so I think we need action to make it legal at a federal level, but then we also need a pretty clear understanding of what is reasonable to expect banks to do in terms of compliance. Because if you set the compliance bar really high, banks just aren't going to be able to do it at a, at a cost that is um, reasonable for businesses to pay. It, the, the alcohol uh, analogies is, is interesting because what I think a lot of people don't always realize is that the way alcohol prohibition ended in, the, in this country was that the federal government simply said, it will not be a freestanding violation of federal criminal law to possess, distribute, or market alcohol. Uh, the states will have that authority. But what remained, and in fact remains to this day, is that it is a federal crime to possess or distribute or transport alcohol in violation of applicable state law. So if I'm in one state and I am uh, want to ship alcohol to a state in a so I, you, I remember when I was growing up, there were some states that only sold the little mini bottles. And so you couldn't, you, you couldn't transport alcohol into the state with a, a larger bottle. Um, that would not only be a violation of the law of the importing state when I crossed the border, it would also be a violation of federal law. And so one thing that enabled is it, it enabled the federal government uh, through the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms to play something of a backstop and to uh, help states um, that did not share the preferences towards alcohol policy of their neighbors, um, help states protect themselves from their neighbors and help uh, uh, limit interstate trafficking. And so one argument that some folks has made, have made, and I've, I certainly make this in the introduction to the book, is that something along those lines might be uh, worthwhile for marijuana as well, so that if, say, Nebraska or uh, Oklahoma does not share the policy preferences that uh, Colorado has with regard to marijuana, that um, they could not only maintain that prohibition locally, but would get federal assistance in preventing trafficking from uh, ju legal jurisdictions uh, to illegal jurisdictions. Um, but I think as, as Julie notes, the legislation that's been proposed, and there are some folks, there was actually, there's actually a piece of bipartisan legislation in the Senate uh, sponsored by Senator Cory Gardner of Colorado and Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, uh, has separate provisions to deal with some of the other issues that still remain. So there's a separate portion of the bill to try and address the banking issue, uh, separate pr portions to deal with other uh, other issues. But but some have argued, and certainly I've argued, that one framework to think about it is have the federal government focus on the, tra the trafficking part, the interstate uh, uh, commerce part, the the we might, if you want to put it in economic terms, the interstate externality part of states having different um, uh, preferences, um, but let states determine what goes on locally. Uh, Andra, one question that's that's posed in the posed by one of our viewers that relates to that is, what do we do about people that have multi-state practices? Um, and um, I mean, so maybe someone has a multi-state practice where they're just uh, operating in states that are that have similar marijuana laws but um if you if you can go online and find lots of maps that all different colors of different states and all the different rules um are there particular professional responsibility issues for uh, attorneys that are 
um, working in different jurisdictions that will, might have different rules uh, with regard to what's legal with marijuana? Yeah, I think I think this is something that it's been difficult for the states to work out. Um, so the, the rules of professional conduct do have a choice of law provision, um, which is somewhat helpful, um, but I think less helpful in this area where there's this fundamental question of, you know, is this is this illegal conduct by by one standard or another? Um, we do have one case where. Um, so there's, there's two other questions too, um, you know, to, to what extent is this a problem for the attorney who advises clients? And then to what extent is this a problem for the attorney's own personal use? Um, I think insofar as the attorney is advising clients, um, the, the choice of law rules and the rules of professional conduct probably work pretty well. And the state where the predominant effect is, is going to be um, in all likelihood that the state that, um, the state that has the authority to impose discipline for the situation. It's, it's more difficult when it's personal use. And there is a case where an attorney had a valid uh, medical marijuana card from Michigan, but was also licensed in Illinois and um, was subject to discipline in Illinois, um, in part for personal use, but there were some other issues too. Um, there has, uh, girlfriend or significant other had had a marijuana business. So, you know, I think this is something that the states haven't worked out um, perfectly well. The other thing I notice in that question is, you know, this issue of uh, in-house being an in-house attorney versus being an external attorney and to what degree that could change the risk calculation. Um, and, you know, that's another really great question. Typically, in-house attorneys are going to have a somewhat bigger role on the business side of things that they will do, you know, some business advice as well as their, their legal advice. Um, and that can get dicey. There was one situation I wrote about in the chapter where an attorney was actually charged with aiding and abetting the client's violation. The client was a legitimate licensed marijuana business entity, um, but there was some question about whether the client had exceeded its authority by um, producing hash oil in addition to other marijuana products. And um, the, the attorney in that case actually got charged with like 13 felony counts for assisting the client in this production. That uh, charge was later um, largely dropped. The attorney eventually pled, I think, to a violation of a city ordinance, something that was not even a misdemeanor. Um, but the attorney had to go through that, you know, difficult time of, of being charged with these felonies. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a risk. It's definitely something that the states haven't worked out really well. Um. Julie, we had a question about whether or not um, uh, marijuana businesses have been turning to Bitcoin or virtual currencies to address their banking needs. Is there much evidence of that? And is that a, is that a viable strategy for uh, marijuana related businesses? Oh. I'm sorry, they've been turning to what? Uh, Bitcoin and <laughs> My virtual currencies. My internet connection shows that moment to be difficult. Yeah. <laughs> so the difficulty, um, with, lots of different difficulties with virtual currencies. Um, one of them is that they're not in widespread use. And so you'd ideally like to sell your product using a type of currency that your customers have. And because not everyone has Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other virtual currency, um, you limit who can buy your product and that's not good for a business. The other real concern that I've heard from folks in the marijuana industry is um, look, um, we're a legitimate business and those, uh, those Bitcoin guys, they're, they're like money launderers and drug traffickers. Um, we don't want to ruin our good reputation by, um, by dealing with uh, some other sketchy industry. We've got enough problems to a se seem legitimate and we don't want to start adopting the policies of drug cartels or um, money launderers. That's not what we want to do. We want to play above board and we think that by going 
um, the virtual currency route um, that it hurts us. And so I think, um, you know, two big uh, hurdles there. And then, then the final one is, you know, at some point, um, people don't live their lives just in the virtual world. And so at some point you want real money to spend. You want dollars or, or some other country's currency. And at that point, you need to convert your uh, Bitcoin or whatever back. And at that point, you're laundering money again. Right? You're taking money that came from an illegal enterprise and converting it into um, currency that you can use in a regular transaction. And so maybe what you're doing by using virtual currencies is just engaging in uh, a more elaborate money laundering scheme. It doesn't make it not money laundering, though. Um, we had some questions about uh, how the federal prohibition relates to employment, and, and there's actually a lot there. So um, you know, for a lot of federal positions, if there's any kind of security clearance involved, um, uh, any illegal drug use uh, within, I think it's the current period, I think it's seven years, if I remember correctly, um, is something that you have to disclose. And depending on the nature of the job, um, might be an issue. Uh, certain, fed, some federal contractors uh, have to comply with uh, drug-free workplace requirements, and marijuana is still covered uh, by that. So. Uh, marijuana use, um, uh, because it's illegal under federal law, insofar as there are uh, requirements for contractors, for those receiving federal funds to comply with federal drug laws generally, it gets swept in. Uh, this is the problem that's occurred with um, gun background checks because um, the requirements of being able to uh, uh, not raise the red flag in a background check are written in broad terms. Uh, marijuana triggers that because it's still illegal. Uh, under uh, federal law. Uh, at the state level, it's just worth noting that questions about whether or not employers have to accommodate, uh, for example, medicinal marijuana use among their employees uh, is generally considered a question of state law. Uh, I know in Washington state, for example, um, the courts there have held that employers as a general matter uh, do not need uh, to accommodate, uh, that, uh, accommodate that, that that's a question that uh, employers um, uh, decision employers can make. Uh, but it appears right now that that's primarily going to be uh, a state by state question. I'm not aware of any uh, federal disability sort of claim uh, uh, along those lines that's been made. And I would think that would be a difficult claim to make given that as far as the federal government is concerned, there is no approved medicinal use of marijuana. Obviously, uh, many states have a different view for purposes of state law, uh, but for purposes of federal law, uh, medicinal uses of marijuana uh, are not recognized. Now, Andre, I think you were going to um, uh, talk about uh, one of the other questions that came in. Yeah, so there, there was a question about how Ohio would handle a, an attorney's personal use. And um, there was an ethics opinion a few years ago. Um, it's ethics opinion 2016-6 that talked about a lawyer's personal use of medical marijuana in Ohio. And um, the opinion mentions, of course, that um, use of marijuana, even though state authorized, is considered illegal under federal law and could subject the attorney to possible prosecution. Um, but as far as attorney discipline goes, um, the court writes that even though the lawyer is answerable to the entire criminal law, um, the lawyer is only professionally answerable to those offenses that demonstrate a lack of honesty or trustworthiness. So the opinion goes on to say that a single violation of the Controlled Substance Act by an attorney using medical marijuana would not by itself demonstrate the, the requisite lack of honesty or trustworthiness to constitute a violation of the state rule of professional conduct. But if there were other misconduct related to the illegal act, such as lying to federal investigators or obtaining a prescription for the purposes of re resale or providing it to a minor, um, then those things could trigger a violation. Okay, great. Um, we got a question which I don't know the answer to, but I don't know if either of you do, about um, whether there are implications for securities law. And we've talked about banking and professional responsibility, mentioned RICO and tax and gun purchases and employment. So if there's one real takeaway, um, it's that the federal prohibition of marijuana has, uh, you know, it has effects that, that permeate many other areas of law because so many areas of law essentially incorporate what federal law criminalizes. And so if federal law criminalizes something, it's assumed that uh, conduct must be engaged in, uh, in accordance with that. But we received a question about whether or not 
Um, there are issues for uh, cannabis companies that are publicly traded, that have publicly traded stock, and whether or not those that raises any issues for trading platforms or brokerage firms. Do either of you know much about that? It's a good question. If, it, uh, if we do a sequel to the book, we will definitely have to uh, include that. Um, that is something that, um, uh, that uh, uh, is, is not, um, uh, not something uh, that we covered. Um, some things though that we did cover in the book for folks that are interested in that, uh, we have a chapter that looks at, um, again, the empirical data that what we've seen. Um, and what's re the real takeaway from that chapter is that during the run up to legalization in Colorado and Washington, there were a lot of really broad claims about what marijuana legalization would do. Proponents said it would reduce uh, use of other drugs, it would reduce drunk driving, it would provide incredible amounts of resources for the state. Uh, opponents worried about school absenteeism and, and other uh, problems uh, in schools about uh, increases in highway accidents due to uh, people operating vehicles uh, high on marijuana. Uh, there were all sorts of concerns about, um, about the, the effects. And it turns out that in most cases on both sides, uh, the, the claims made were exaggerated. Uh, marijuana uh, revenues, uh, tax revenues have certainly been significant, but they're still a tiny fraction of Colorado and Washington state. I did a program last week where someone asked, you know, might all of the economic pressures caused by uh, the COVID-19 shutdowns induce states to legalize marijuana to fill the gap? And there's just not enough money there um, uh, to, to do that. Um, uh, thus far, the evidence on things like um, uh, uh, effects on school, whether it's absenteeism or behavioral issues, um, uh, rates of treatment for uh, marijuana addiction and the like, uh, do not appear to have been driven up by, uh, by marijuana legalization in states that have done that. Uh, but as the authors of that chapter stress, um, it, it's, it's, it's still early and, and you know, it, it will take time to fully understand um, the consequences. Uh, there are also uh, several chapters in the book that deal with some of the constitutional law issues. Um, one of them is the uh, anti-commandeering doctrine, uh, something that we haven't really talked about yet. The fact that the federal government can prohibit marijuana, but the federal government can't tell Alabama or Ohio or California to prohibit marijuana. Um, uh, states are free to cooperate with uh, criminalization of marijuana and enforcement against it or to withdraw completely. And the Supreme Court just recently heard a case called NCAA versus Murphy involving um, a gambling law with that presented this question. New Jersey wanted to reduce uh, or essentially decriminalize uh, sports betting in the state and federal law said that states that had not already uh, uh, legalized sports gambling before a certain date, so basically states other than, than Nevada couldn't, and um, the Supreme Court uh, held that the federal government could not stop New Jersey from doing that. If the federal government wants to make certain types of gambling or activity illegal independently, it can do so, uh, but then the federal government has to bear the, the cost and expense of, of actually engaging in enforcement, of hiring the law enforcement officers, uh, devoting a, a prosecutorial resources uh, and the like. Uh, so that is covered um, uh, in in uh, the book a as well. Um, and um, uh, there's also a, a chapter that, that raises a question about whether or not uh, the Supreme Court should uh, reconsider uh, its decision in Gonzalez versus Raich, which said that the Commerce Clause reaches even intrastate non-commercial uh, possession and distribution of marijuana. Um, that chapter by Will Bode of uh, the University of Chicago argues that if a state has actually created a separate intrastate market, even if it's say just for medical purposes, uh, that perhaps um, the Supreme Court should view that as being apart from the streams of interstate commerce. Uh, I mentioned the chapter on uh, uh, enforcement discretion. Uh, there's also a chapter that looks at the, the dramatic changes in, in politics. Um, there is probably no issue other than same-sex marriage, where we have seen as dramatic a shift in popular opinion in such a short period of time. A lot of times um, for, to see a dramatic shift in uh, public opinion 
on issues like this, it really has to be a generational shift. Basically, um, younger generations' uh, opinions become dominant, not because they're convincing anybody else, but because over time, uh, people that were born at a different time just have different views of things. Um, the rate of change of opinion about marijuana has really been uh, quite dramatic. Uh, and it's one of the reasons we've seen so many states uh, move in this direction. And it will be interesting uh, to see if that continues. Um, the authors of that chapter, though, make another point, which I think is really very interesting, which is while support for marijuana legalization especially for medicinal purposes, but also for recreational purposes, has increased dramatically. Um, for most voters, it's not their highest priority. So if you ask voters, do you support this? Majorities in most jurisdictions will say yes. But when it comes to actually making their voting decisions at the ballot box, there does not yet appear to be evidence that this is an issue that is uh, changing people's views of, of candidates. Uh, so it's not clear if there is much political advantage for individual candidates. And this may also explain why you see ballot initiatives being a very successful strategy uh, for those that have uh, sought reform of, of marijuana laws. Uh, and you have not seen as dramatic a change among uh, the positions espoused uh, uh, by, um, uh, by politicians. Um, uh, so that, that's something that, that the, uh, another of the chapters uh, talks about. Um, something that is not talked about a lot in the book, which is just interesting, and I know some folks have asked about, uh, and I've gotten emails about this, uh, is during the presidential campaign, uh, some uh, candidates in the Democratic primary said that they would legalize marijuana on day one uh, with an executive order. Uh, and like a lot of promises that presidential candidates make and have made for a long time, uh, it, it sounds good. Uh, but it's a lot easier said than done. Um, to legalize marijuana at the federal level uh, would either require legislation or it would require going through the process of rescheduling marijuana under the CSA, the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, and that would at the very least be a long uh, arduous process. It would be an, a, a regulatory process. Uh, and as we've seen with the Trump administration, with some of its deregulatory promises, the president making promises about deregulation he would push, but then the EPA or the Army Corps of Engineers or whomever actually has to go through the long slog of complying with the Administrative Procedure Act and getting notice and comment and it taking a while and then someone's going to sue you once you're done and you're going to have to go through the litigation, um, marijuana rescheduling would uh, likely uh, create those issues as well. And there's an added wrinkle uh, that the U.S. has some treaty commitments uh, which could be obviated by legislation. Uh, but it's at least an open question uh, whether those treaty commitments uh, would constrain uh, the ability of uh, the executive branch to reschedule, reschedule uh, marijuana uh, administratively. Uh, uh, since we're uh, running uh, uh, up to the bottom of the hour, hour I didn't know if, uh, if Julie or Andre, if either of you have, have closing thoughts you wanted to, uh, you wanted to share? No, I so think I'll, we, oh, sorry, go ahead. So I was just going to say there was a, a question about the uh, Safe Banking Act. Um, short answer is hasn't passed yet. Not sure it can get through the Senate. Um, if it does get through the Senate, I think it would be a marginal improvement. It says you know, where regulators don't um, punish banks for dealing with marijuana businesses that comply with state law, but you've still got the problem of the um, regulatory burden um, and making sure that you're, you're customers aren't violating any of the, the federal enforcement priorities. So um, I think that the SAFE Act is interesting. I think it moves the ball forward, but I don't think it's an answer. Andra, any thoughts? Um, I, th I think we've really covered everything. Seven, eight. Um, as I hope um, this uh, session has um, made clear, uh, there's a lot of, of interesting aspects uh, of marijuana policy. Uh, it's not just a question of do you legalize or not legalize. Um, the fact, the nature of our federal system actually creates uh, lots of intricacies and lots of conflicts and problems. Uh, and um, the current situation uh, uh, certainly does that. Um, for those that have asked about the book, uh, here is information uh, on the book, um, Marijuana Federalism, Uncle Sam and Mary Jane. Um, it's available on Amazon, both in a hard copy uh, and in Kindle. 
form. It can also be purchased through the Brookings Institutions uh, Press, and there's the web address for that. Uh, and there again is the URL for the CLE form again. Um, the, the, the last three digits again it, uh, are 278. Um, uh, for those of you that need that, the last three digits are uh, 278. And um, again, thank you uh, for attending this webinar. Please give us feedback uh, on what worked, on what didn't. Um, it, it looks like we will do, be doing more of these programs in addition to the live programs we do here in the law school, as well as the pre-recorded pro, pre -recorded programs, uh, which can also be used uh, for CLE purposes. Um, so thank you all again. Uh, thank you, uh, Andra and Julie. Uh, thanks also to the uh, AV folks and computer folks uh, here at, at the law school that help make programs uh, like, uh, uh, like this uh, possible. Uh, thank you all again, and I'll leave this slide up uh, for folks uh, that, want, that want to see it. Um, real quickly, there was a question about course materials on the uh, law school website. Um, there are links to PDFs of the CLE materials. They include the introduction uh, to the book. So hopefully my introduction is enticing and people who uh, read the introduction will wanna read more about professional responsibility and banking regulation and the other issues uh, that the book explores. Um, uh, and so that information is available on the law school website. That's law.case.edu. If you scroll down the website to the events section, uh, this event uh, is, uh, will be listed. Uh, thank you all again. Uh, those last three digits were 278. Um, and uh, we appreciate you all uh, attending today. Thanks, Jonathan. All right, thank you both. Thank you.